it's really uh, nice to be here, uh, especially uh, presenting this award. Um, I'm a member of the generation, and I think most of you are here too, who Paul spoke so forcefully for in his magazines like The Realist. You know, our generation was really something special too. Look what we did. We, we started the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement. We stopped a war. I don't know of any other generation that has ever stopped a war, and we did it. Our generation had so much potential, and what the hell happened to us? We became these piggy, piggy people that wound up helping put Ronald Reagan in office. And I, and I looked back and I said, well, what changed? What changed? from this, this communal group that we had put together. What changed in our thing then? You know, I really can only find one thing that really was a change that I put my finger on. Back in those days, the per capita use of marijuana was higher than it is now. Everybody smoked pot. And then later on, after we got through college, we went into life, we had families and jobs, kind of worried about our social respectability, and most of us stop smoking pot. Oh, no. I cannot believe for one second that we would be in the mess we are in today if we had kept on smoking marijuana as much as we did back in the 60s. And Paul Krasner and I were two of the people who never stopped smoking pot. <laughs> Paul Krasner was a hero of mine. The very, when I was 17, I started college. One of the first magazines I ever subscribed to in my life was The Realist Magazine. And that magazine changed my perspective on everything. It just made me learn that, you know, what was out there was not what it always seemed to be. And he did it in such a, such a fantastic way that he would take us through these, these situations and we don't know where reality ended and nonsense began because that's what the world seems to be. We don't know where reality ends and nonsense begins. And it's just as crazy today. And Paul Krasner did that. And uh, he forever changed my life. He changed the life of so many people. And, to pre and for when, when Tom called me up and asked me, would you like to help present this award to Paul Krasner? I says, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Talk about a kid's idol. And you will be able to say thank you very much for what you did for my life. Thank you so much, Paul. I am beyond grateful. Well, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's very heartwarming. Uh, stick around later. We're gonna, there's going to be a screening of American uh, Sniper. I know you know. Um, First, I guess I should explain what, what uh, the realist was. Uh, there was um, there was Mad Magazine, and uh, I remember I wrote a few things for Mad Magazine, but some of my ideas were turned down because they were too grown up. And uh, and I said to the publisher uh, William Gaines, uh, I guess when you just have gone over a million and a quarter of subscribers, who were all teenagers. You don't want to change horses in midstream. And Bill Gaines said, not when a horse has a rocket up its ass. And uh, I, that, those words uh, were my marching orders to start a, uh, a magazine of satire. Uh, just recently, uh, Time magazine said that uh, The Realist was, of, of all the magazines, that The Realist was the uh, only, was uh, for 50 years ago was the equivalent to what the Charlie magazine was. And it was interesting to me because uh, 50 years ago, um, when uh, I published an article on John F. Kennedy's uh, first marriage, uh, which uh, was, act was not Jackie Kennedy, and uh, I was going to publish it, uh, once I found that there was a genealogy which showed that this, uh, on page 884, there was the story of Dury Malcolm marrying John F. Kennedy, the son of Joseph Kennedy. And so I called the White House 
uh, and I went through all the motions. I said, I'd like to speak to President Kennedy and uh, the uh, person at the other end of the phone said, uh, he's in a meeting now. Uh, that's how naive I was. And I asked to speak to Press Secretary uh, Salinger, and he said, no, he's in a meeting too. And as I went down the line, I said, well, can you give me a statement? And, and she had it already prepared, and it was a denial, of course. Uh, but it was a news story, that, that and a denial. Uh, it had been uh, a rumor, but it had been the most asked question at the Daily News and at the Sunday Parade magazine. Uh, but it was kept on, uh, it was just a taboo. Uh, and so when word got around that I was going to publish that, uh, that people from the New York Times and Associated Press and uh, Time Magazine and Newsweek and uh, uh, TV and radio stations from around uh, the country and around the, the globe, uh, all waiting for me to break the story so that they could then uh, publish it. And uh, so I realized how chicken they were. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then they told me, Time Magazine, Researcher said, "You know, the moment you publish this, then we're going to be. Uh, uh, we'll pick it up. I guarantee you that." And they did. They all did. And they refer they referred to the realist as a shabby Greenwich Village mag uh, rag. And uh, I thought, when I saw this thing in Time Magazine, now I thought we've come a long way, baby. Uh, but that never was my intention. My intention was just to communicate without compromise. And uh, my credo was that uh, irreverence is my only sacred cow. And so uh, it was just, free speech existed before the First Amendment. The First Amendment just codified it. And so um, I began to get a lot of uh, serious journalistic investigative reporting that people would send in that they couldn't get in their own publications. Uh, and also cartoons from New Yorker cartoonists who got rejected uh, because uh, cartoons were either too controversial or uh, or too out of uh, too too much in bad taste. And so um, I, I realized that uh, there was a, a, a really fear. The woman from Newsweek said, "I said, well, you had the information. Why didn't you publish it?" And she said, in one word, fear. And uh, and so one, once I published it, then then every, they all published it then. I mean, on, on NBC, on their bulletin board, they had a sign that, that, that told them not to run anything on that story until a different medium uh, did, did it. And, that would, and then they could blame somebody else. So it was all, you know, one thing, anybody, National Enquirer, they wouldn't care as long as somebody else broke it before the news before they did. So uh, The Realist became a central clearinghouse uh, of articles and cartoons that uh, did not appear in magazines and newspapers because they were too controversial or, or, too, uh, or bad taste, uh, which was uh, very subjective, as all humor is subjective. So um, I began from the very beginning uh, to have anti-war material in the magazine. Uh, and sometimes uh, not, not my own. I, I've reprinted an article from Liberation Magazine, which was published by Dave Dellinger. Uh, he was a heroic uh, peacemaker that some of you may have uh, known. He was uh, an incredible person. And he published uh, uh, an article on American atrocities in Vietnam. And uh, it was so powerful, I, I had the Liberation Magazine people uh, they sent out, uh, 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 I paid, I think, $90 for this. To, they sent out a copy of that to every single uh, person in Congress and in the Senate and also uh, to President Johnson then. And nobody responded to it except Bobby Kennedy, uh, uh, who uh, he acknowledged it at least. Uh, but, but he was the only one who even... Uh, uh, had any reaction to it, uh, and uh, so I mean, so torture is not just something that is uh, uh, happening these days. It happened in Vietnam. It happened before that, uh, 
and uh, a lot of people, of, of course, Lenny will be happy to know that a lot of people uh, started smoking pot uh, in uh, Korea, and, um, and, 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 and then in Vietnam, so, uh, you know, there wasn't a total loss. Uh, so, um, <coughs> one of the things in, in The Realist was that, um, uh, I, I thought of this now when uh, there was that mention of the uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell program. And ironically, it was Colin Powell who uh, convinced uh, President Clinton uh, to not uh, get rid of the de Don't Ask, Don't, don't Tell, but to, but to keep it as the policy. And I had this imaginary interview with Colin Powell saying that, you know, you were, had a, a military background and you knew that uh, Ameri African Americans uh, were not allowed, uh, they had a separate contingent for them to be in the army. I said, so you should know better, you know, that they, uh, that they wanted, they, were, they didn't want to say, say, sleep in the same barracks with black people. You know? and, um, and I said to him in my imaginary conversation, well, you know, how could you, how could you say that? You know, it's um, the same thing happened uh, with with gays. That the, uh, none of the people of the servicemen wanted to serve, it, what to even be in the in the same barracks as the gay uh, soldiers were. And I and I said to him, you know, how how what what what's the difference between that kind of of, of discrimination? And uh, he said, well, we never told anybody we were black. <laughs> and so, uh, this was the forerunner of the Don't Ask, Don't Ask, Don't Ask. And so, um, I, 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 um, I became more of an activist uh, when I started just going to the anti-war demonstrations that uh, were going on around the country. And uh, uh, I, as a stand-up comedian, I would go around and uh, speak at the, I was sort of the Bob Hope exam, uh, equivalent to the peace movement uh, instead of the USO. Uh, and Bob Hope, he, he, he always, he never had really a point of view on it. He would just say, you know, he was at a, uh, a camp somewhere um, in, in uh, the Southeast Asia and the plane would fly over and he would say, oh, there goes Senator McCarthy and everybody, you know, he didn't say whether Senator McCarthy was helpful or, or, or not, but it was just the reference was what, what he was very good at. So, um, at uh, one of the meetings, uh, I, I, I met Abby Hoffman and uh, we left together and became friends and there were a group of friends on the Lower East Side in New York and uh, who were all activists and um, I went with Abby and his wife Anita to the Florida Keys where we were going to go on a work vacation. And um, one night, uh, and this was in the Florida Keys, and there was a hurricane, and things were flying around the room, and uh, we were watching TV. Lyndon Johnson was speaking, and uh, he said uh, at one point, uh, uh, we're not so puddin headed that we're going to give up our half of the war. And we looked at each other and said, we got to go to Chicago next summer and, and, and protest the, uh, the Democratic Convention. The Vietnam War was a uh, bipartisan war, and this particular time, the it was under the Democrats' watch. And um, so um, we decided to go back to New York. Um, I, I called, uh, made, I made two calls. Uh, one to Jerry Rubin in New York to organize uh, a, a group meeting uh, when we got back on the 31st of December of 67, six, of, of 66, no, 67, one of those years. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, I also called Dick Gregory uh, just to tell him that we were going to come to Chicago and raid his city. And, and uh, he said, okay, he would, he would lead a march uh, through there. And he said uh, he was going to run for president that year. And he asked me, he said, I'm thinking of having Bob Dylan as my vice president for uh, running me. And uh, I said, I don't, you know, I, I, I can guarantee you that he's not going to run for any electoral uh, position. It's not his style, you know. 
Uh, he's busy learning how to sing like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and so, um, so the um, so when we went back to New York and had this meeting, uh, and it was agreed, it was just a group of about maybe ten or fifteen of these uh, uh, activists uh, that were friends, and. Um, and, and we decided that we were going to go to Chicago in the summer of 68, but we had to, um, I felt as a journalist, that we should have a, a name for it, so that uh, and journalists always need for their lead paragraph a who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, and I thought it was important to have a who. And I, I thought about it, and I thought about... Um, uh, we went through all kinds of things, and I thought of um, the, uh, the yippies. Uh, it, would, uh, it was a shout of joy, and and it, because and it's, it stemmed from the initials Y, I, and P, and yippies would be the organic way to give a name to it. And so, um, uh, youth, uh, Y was for youth, because it was a, a, a generational death that was going on there. Um, the I was for international because this was a, a global jump in, con in evolu a, a jump in evolutionary consciousness. Uh, it wasn't just on Haight Ashbury in San Francisco; it was uh, around the world, uh, in Paris, in Mexico, in Czechoslovakia, all simultaneously. And um, so um, that's why it was. The I was for international, and P was for party, both kinds, uh, a, uh, as if it was a uh, political party and as a party. Uh, and, uh, oh, that's for me. I'm not here. <laughs> and so um, we would, we, uh, the best way it was, de was decided that, that what we represented were um, a... a I just gave a name to something that already, a phenomenon that already existed, which was that uh, been had been happening when uh, the hippies uh, were, you know, they, they, they were stoned and they were in the park and they were very peaceful. And, and the more straight uh, political activists like uh, Tom Hayden and Rennie Davis and some of the others were very straight, but as they met at different rallies and demonstrations, there was some kind of uh, hybrid uh, person that was developing, which, uh, because they realized that the, um, the straight uh, activists started smoking marijuana and wearing longer hair and beads, and, and the stoned hippies uh, learned more about what was going on in Vietnam, the cause of it and the hypocrisy, and uh, uh, the, and it became a different breed, and uh, because they each understood what what the others were doing, the uh, there was an ultimate um, linear uh, process from putting kids in prison uh, in the United States for smoking a weed. Uh, all the way to Southeast Asia, where napalm was being dropped on kids. That was the ultimate extension of dehumanization. And that was the relationship between the right to smoke this flower, as Lenny Bruce called it, uh, and, and to kill kids on the other side of the globe. And there was that understanding, and that was, uh, that was the core of, of their being. Uh, and so, uh, once we decided that we would have that name, everybody agreed that it had the right uh, flavor to it. And um, so we called the press conference, and we had it. Uh, 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 Judy Collins, Judy Collins, the singer, had a uh, at the Americana Hotel in New York was going to have a um, uh, a new album, and and her publicist had had it in in a, a conference room at that hotel and uh, then we all the reporters all stayed for the announcement of the yippies and uh, I remember that uh, Alex Ginsburg was sitting there and I said he wouldn't and and Eugene McCarthy was uh, running for president then as the peace candidate and 
he was um, going to, and they were called the Clean Fijians because the, uh, the young people who went representing him went from door to door and it had to look neat. And I said, so Ginsburg would not be able to have supported him because he had this long beard and long hair. And a reporter stood up and said to me, well, would you cut your hair if it would end the war? And uh, caught me off guard, but Ginsburg uh, stood up and said to the reporter, would you let your hair grow if it, if it would end the war? And this started even in the corridor, people saying, would you cut off your pinky if it would end the war? And it got more and more bizarre. Uh, so um, anyway, we, we, uh, when, Flor when, when uh, it, it came time to go to Chicago, uh, it was very, uh, uh, we had just made up th that this existed, but the myth of it became a reality, and people, we opened an office in New York uh, for the Youth International Party, and students from campuses all around the country uh, uh, wanted to become chapters of that, and it just happened organically, and, uh, and the myth became a reality before our eyes, and so, uh, we got to Chicago, and the group of us were there, uh, and we noticed that there were uh, plainclothes policemen. Uh, we weren't sure, but they, but we decided to uh, get in the car and drive around and see if they followed us. And so um, it looked like they were following us, uh, but we stopped at a, at a bus stop. There was a fellow on a bus on a uh, bench there, and we said to him, "We're going to go around." this block now uh, 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 in the wrong way, the wrong direction. And if they follow us in the wrong direction, then we'll know that they're following us. And so sure we did. And uh, <coughs> as we came back, the fellow stood up on the bench and went like this. And so now, the ones who were following us didn't know whether to follow us or him. Because uh, they didn't know what he accomplished while we were going around the block. And so, um, uh, at so then we went a little further and we stopped the car, the, the other car stopped it, and we just went right up to the car and we said to the uh, uh, people, that, the, the guys in the car, we said, uh, are you guys following us? And they said, yes. Then are you, and then Abby Hoffman said, well, are you uh, uh, local or federal? And they would say, we're, we're local, plain clothes street, uh, 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 plain clothesmen, and um, uh, we said, well, uh, you know, uh, that's pretty good. We, uh, uh, and they say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're surveilling you for uh, 24 hours. We say, oh, wow, uh, three, three uh, groups at different times following us? And they said, no, no, just two. We have, we're, we're short. <laughs> so then they, they, you know, because we started this conversation with them, uh, we offered them a yippee, bu yippee buttons to put them on, on their lapels. And, and uh, they said, well, we can't do that. We're on duty. I said, yeah, but this way, if, if we lose you, uh, we'll know we can recognize you. We'll wave to you. So they said, okay. And they put their little buttons on. And then because we started this conversation with them, there was some rapport. And they said uh, uh, they had been following us for like maybe an hour. And uh, they said, look, aren't you guys hungry? We want to have lunch. And we said, okay, well, uh, you know, we're new in the city here. Uh, could you suggest uh, a, a, a restaurant? And one of the uh, cops said, well, uh, there's the pickle barrel in Old Town in Chicago. Uh, and they have great food there. And, uh, and the other cop said, yes, and their prices are reasonable. If I felt like I was in a commercial of the future. <laughs> where all authorities were cops who recommended uh, things. <laughs> and so um, uh, we said, uh, okay, well, we don't know how to get there. And, and, the, and the cops said, well, follow us. <laughs> this, this was one of those rare movements. Uh, uh, things that you, that you just had to, you wanted to uh, uh, keep them forever in amber. Uh, and so we followed them. Um, uh, at first, I thought we were gonna, they were gonna take the, you know, the same route, but we went right to the restaurant, and we we got at separate tables. So, uh, uh, and, uh, but we were watching each other. I, I, I think that was uh, etiquette uh, to uh, let, let to be at separate tables uh, with the with the police. Uh, 
And uh, it's been said here that we stopped uh, the uh, war. Uh, I, I, I think that was not that true. Um, it, it certainly did help uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, uh, decide not to run again, uh, that there was so much uh, in it. But I, I think the Viet Cong had a little bit of, of help uh, ending the war and, and should have been given credit. Um, so, uh, so that kind of explained what the Yippies were about. Uh, and uh, um, everybody I know who was in that, uh, as Lenny said, you know, not everybody turned. All the people, you know, there was a difference when when they got uh, married and had kids, and they had to get maybe a little bit more conservative. But everybody I knew from that time has kept this, their their, their uh, values system. Uh, So, uh, so that, that's the story of the Yippies. Uh, I, I thank you for um, the award. Uh, I, I, at first, when uh, Tom Swan called me about it, I, I had a resistance because I, didn't, I felt I, I was not a veteran, and, and they really sacrificed. I, I was just having fun. Uh, you know, Phil Oakes, the folk singer, described what we were doing. They said a demonstration should... Uh, turn you on, not turn you off, and uh, and uh, and that was inspired by the War Resisters League when they had young people take a yellow submarine about six feet long and carried it across New York uh, City and and uh, launched it into the Hudson River there. And as we were doing it, as we went across town like that, kids were following us and they had balloons and. Uh, uh, they knew that war was serious, but they also knew that it could be uh, uh, done with a sense of joy. And so, um, uh, and that inspired the Yippies to, to do the same thing. So, um, so I, I, I thank you for honoring me like this, and uh, I appreciate it, and I'm inspired by uh, the feeling here of, of optimism, that, that uh, hope is, is, is not, uh, did not dissolve. Uh, with the salt and sea. So, uh, thank you.